Well, hello YouTube, it's me Fortmaster, and welcome back to another Game Theory Reaction. And this one is, this Star Wars item could actually exist soon? Well, I mean, considering I have seen videos of people making actual lightsabers, though, I mean, in reality, they're much more just like very controlled, like, plasma throwers. Or... What other, well, I mean, like, what other uh, Star Wars tech do they have? I mean, they have droids. I mean, with all the talk of AI that's been going on right now. FTL, I don't think that hyperdrive is really going to be a thing for a while, if it uh, ever does. Uh, blasters? I mean, you never know what the military's experimenting with. <sighs> yeah, I, 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 I really don't know. I, I really don't. <laughs> Because, you know, the whole thing with, like, Star Wars and stuff, uh, is that it's, it's not really even science fiction, it's science fantasy. It's a fantasy story that you put laser guns into and put it in space and you call it a day. So, yeah, I have no idea what they could be really referring to. So, yeah, of course, as always, original video is linked in the description if you haven't seen it for some reason. Corner video will lead to my film theory reaction. And, yeah, with all that out of the way... Let's get this thing started then, shall we? Can flying vehicles actually exist? Planes, helicopters, hovercrafts, if you want to count them. Yeah, I mean, we have flying vehicles already. I know that's not what he's talking about. I'm not talking about helicopters or drones or whatever this thing is. I'm talking about the what? kind of thing we see in Star Wars Outlaws. Something that looks and acts like a regular motorcycle just without those old fashioned wheels. Is there actual science in this science fiction or does it just fall apart when you don't have the magical force binding it together? Well, I mean, the force really, I mean, that's technology. The force has nothing to do with it or, oh God, can you imagine like a Star Wars uh, alternate reality or Elseworlds story, however you wanted to call it, but where like all the technology in the universe, like is dependent on the Force in some way, and then the Force just stops working for some reason, and then everything just stops functioning. Oh God, that'd be a hor that'd be horrible. Oh dear theorists, we're about to find out. Hello Internet! Welcome to Game Theory, the show that's only worried about one force, gravity. Especially when it comes to today's topic, because this episode is uh, yeah, sponsored Star Wars by Outlaws. Ubisoft and their right. latest game, Star Wars Outlaws. Made in collaboration with Lucas Games, Star Wars Outlaws changes the typical Star Wars formula in a great way. Instead of focusing on Jedi, the Force, and lightsabers, we get to see the other side of the coin and live out our Han Solo fantasies of being a galactic scoundrel as we take on the role of Cave. This. Set between the Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, the Empire are trying desperately to snuff out the Rebellion, which leaves small planets on the edge of the galaxy with very little oversight, allowing the criminal underworld to rise up and take control. Ubisoft actually invited me and a bunch of other creators to LA so we could get to see the game firsthand. It was great to meet other creators and compare notes with what we enjoyed about the game. For some, it was the complete open world, which surprisingly is a first for the Star Wars franchise. For others, it was the dynamic reputation system that dramatically changes your gameplay depending on who you side with. And some just really enjoyed getting to pet your adorable companion Nyx. I may have been one of them. Who's a good boy? Of Who's course. the goodest little alien that ferociously attacks the faces of my enemies. You are? Yeah, yeah, you are. However, there was one part of the game that everyone I spoke to agreed that they loved. The speeder bike. Nothing quite beats jumping on your speeder and whizzing off to explore the massive open world before you. It really made me want to go home and take my own motorcycle on an adventure. But then- Okay, so from somebody who, you know, hasn't played the game, is Star Wars Outlaws, you know, at all good? Because I've been hearing a lot of stuff about the game being sort of, like... It's not bad from what I've heard. It's just sort of meh. It's like, from what I've heard, and from what I've heard people say, it's basically just, if you like Ub the open world Ubisoft games, you'll like this, because it's literally just more of the same. And I wanted to know from, you know, people who've played it, like, is that true? Like, what do you think? Is the game actually any good? <laughs> Because from what I've heard of Ubisoft's, you know, um, recent stock performance, I don't think it's performing as good as they might have hoped. 
Then, reality set in. Sure, riding my bike definitely makes boring trips a little more exhilarating, but it doesn't really compare to the coolness that is essentially a hover bike. How can I feel truly free when I'm always attached to the ground? Which leaves the obvious question. Will hover vehicles like that ever be possible? People have been asking this question since the 1950s, and yet, decades have gone by, and I'm still reliant on ground-based wheels like a chump. That being said, just because it hasn't hit the mainstream doesn't mean science isn't making huge strides in this field. All those kids that grew up watching Star Wars are now out there making tech that could turn these pieces of science fiction into science facts. So, will it ever be possible to have a speeder bike like Kay's? Prepare to jump to light speed theorists because the answers are out there. We just need to find them. Ready? Punch it. If we- You know, <laughs> thinking about it, I mean like, I don't really know if I'd even want like a hover vehicle like that. Purely just for the fact that, well, I mean, you know the whole thing with like, you know, when they always depict hover vehicles like that and sci-fi and stuff like that, it's always, they always go like really fast, They're always like high speed, which, you know, which I mean, you know, people will always want to get places quickly. But my whole problem would be, you know, stopping because, you know, uh, with something like this, it's not like, you know, with basically everything we have today where stopping is just a matter of applying friction and having things rubbing together and having them stop. I mean, even just, even without that, you know, air resistance and stuff like that. But with this, you very much, I mean, I mean, stopping is very much a, a case of, you know, oh, you having, you're having to, like, instead of just propelling forward, you're having to ha have it set basically in reverse, per, uh, pushing out whatever force is moving you forward, basically the other way around to slow you down. And then there's the other whole, you know, safety problem of what if you, you know, your power dies. In a normal vehicle nowadays, if you run out of power, you just, like, you just keep coasting, rolling along until you stop or you apply the brake yourself. But with that, if you lose power, I mean, you fall. And, um, at last I checked, the ground wasn't that soft. If anything, that just, uh, that just even puts even more, like, credence into the whole thing of having, like, those, uh, what was it, like, airbag vests that you, uh, that you sometimes see for, like, motorcycle riders. If we're gonna get a hover bike of our own, I figured it would probably be wise to take a look at what science, or science, the game actually uses to achieve this. And fortunately, yeah, I a couple have the more to sit italics. down with the developers and ask Quotation marks, never mind, that's the actual word. The primary source. They confirmed to me that much like other speeders in Star Wars, K-Speeder uses technology known as Repulsor Lift. This tech is used all over the Star Wars universe, from yeah, pod yeah. racers, to assault vehicles, even to chairs. Basically, if it's floating, it's probably using repulsor lift but what does that actually mean well there is if it's a repulsor lift that means it's really ugly it's so ugly that gravity wants nothing to do with it it's an official book series that's designed to show the inner workings of various vehicles from star wars including repulsor lift technology and it's called incredible cross sections according to those books repulsor lift technology works by pushing against gravity in order to produce thrust which is pretty vague isn't that kind of just how thrust works exactly but not yes. to worry because there's one other book that goes into a little bit more detail the yt 1300 millennium falcon owners workshop manual it states that repulsor lift engines achieve this thrust by creating a field of negative gravity which pushes against each planet's own gravitational field that's all just a lot of fancy words that simply translate to one thing anti-gravity unfortunately for my yeah, there's no of such thing as anti-gravity anti-gravity doesn't actually exist and i don't mean that we've looked around the universe and just haven't figured it out yet i mean anti-gravity cannot exist it would literally break the rules of physics as we know it. Every object in the universe has mass, and everything that has mass also has a gravitational pull, from the tiniest electrons to supermassive black holes. So, so to have anti-gravity, you'd need like, you would basically, no, not basically, you would need negative mass. And I, the only time I've ever heard of negative mass even being like a concept was like, I think it had something to do with like wormholes because like they were I think it was, I think this is a Neil deGrasse Tyson thing I saw a while ago I can't remember off the top of my head but they were basically saying that you know uh, for a wormhole to exist you basically had something to do with it wanting to close like naturally just because of the way they were so you needed negative mass to basically keep the thing open 
think that was it. Jeez, I'm glad to see if I can try to find that again. So, in order for something to be the opposite of that, to have an anti-gravitational pull, or would it be push at that point? Either way, to achieve that, it would therefore need negative mass. And Literally that's just what I just, not yeah. possible. Unlike some of the other forces in our universe, like electricity or magnetism, which can have positive and negative values or north and south poles, gravity only has positive values. If you take two objects and smush them together, their masses always add to each other. They never cancel out. Even stuff like antimatter, which sounds like it should be the complete opposite of regular matter, has been proven to have regular mass and therefore be affected by gravity. Yeah, you would need not antimatter, but negative matter. But then if you had an- oh, but, but then you have like negative antimatter or anti-negative matter. And then just you have all four quadrants and the entire universe starts going nuts like everything else. So, with Star Wars lore understandably leaning more into fiction than science, is there something that does exist that could help get my hoverbike dreams <laughs> off the ground? Just tie a bunch of helium balloons to it. Yeah, perfect. Now, I'm sure a lot of you out there are already looking at your screens thinking, Tom, we already have vehicles that hover. They're literally called hovercrafts. And yes, you're right. Those are hovering vehicles. We've even seen ones that are roughly the size of a motorcycle. But there's a big reason they don't fit the bill for our speeder bike. Hovercrafts work by sucking in air and sending it through high-powered fans, which in turn pressurizes the air and sends it directly underneath the vehicle. This creates an air cushion that allows the hovercraft to well, hover, hover yeah. partially. In order to make sure that the air doesn't immediately expand outwards, hovercrafts have what's called a skirt, which keeps the air pressure contained and pointing down, allowing it to keep you off the ground. But take a look at Kay's speeder bike. Or oh, doesn't have that, bike yeah. for that matter. We can see there's no skirt on this thing, which means there's no pressurized air cushion to hold it up. And that means hovercrafts ain't gonna cut it. Plus, I'm not really sure anyone can look cool while riding something like this. Now, I mean, you're, are you watching the same thing I am? That looks very cool. You don't strictly need a skirt to use fans or propellers for flight. Companies like Aerofex, Hoversurf, and Airwinds Technologies have created flying motorcycle-style vehicles using incredibly powerful fans and propellers to create the lift that keeps you off the ground. But at that point, it feels more like you're flying than levitating. And while K-Speeder does clearly displace some amount of dust and debris, the sand clowns these things create are <laughs> extreme. Yeah, if this I'd imagine. Were our solution, we would be the reason that sand gets everywhere in this universe, and I'm not sure Anakin would take too kindly to that. But you see, of it's I our got to fault. inspect the bike close up at the Ubisoft event. And let me tell you, the attention to detail was so on point, even the throttle and switches worked, which means that I can confirm there are no fans anywhere on this thing. So we're safe from Vader's wrath this time, but with that as a dead end, I need to keep looking. Fortunately, there was one more device that I'd remembered from my many years years on the internet, and I was hoping that it would provide the solution. Back in 2015, Lexus came out with a very impressive commercial for a new type oh, of transportation, the a skateboard. Not exactly a new kind of technology, and definitely not what you'd expect from a car company, but it was for good reason. God, I think I, I remember that, so if I remember correctly, that one used... what was it? I think it used like superconductors or something, and you saw the smoke pouring out. That wasn't smoke. That was like I think that was uh, that was boiling liquid nitrogen or, or something. I think either or was it dry ice? I can't remember. But yeah, they, uh, if you've ever seen like superconductors, uh, if you put them above a magnet, they'll just kind of stick there. It's like it is so weird. And I could very much imagine you use some sort of sci-fi version of that, and. It just, you haven't used the, the planet's magnetic field as opposed to, you know, just a magnet sitting underneath. It was unlike anything we'd seen before. It was hovering. That isn't CGI. That is an actual working hoverboard that real people were able to ride and do tricks on. I mean, admittedly, it also did, I think it did require, again, like the pad or the trail to actually work because, you know, magnets. Secrets, a super unique material known as a superconductor. Yeah, Despite there we the go. name, I superconductors remember aren't train employees with superpowers. In Tom, you're making my inner foamer angry. That's not a conductor, that's the fat controller. He owns the railway. If you want a conductor, use one of these guys. Okay, sorry, got that off my chest. Back to the theory. 
Instead, they are materials that, when cooled down to an extremely low temperature, their electrons are able to freely move around in such a way that the object is able to produce an electromagnetic field. And as we can see from the commercial, they are super powerful. It even goes over the water, which is perfect for our speeder bike. In Star Wars Outlaws, Kay can encounter experts that help her upgrade her tech. And one of those upgrades is a hydro repulsor that allows her to ride over water. However, while this hoverboard looks good on the surface, once I took a peek under the hood, all of my hovering dreams quickly melted away. Yeah, superconductive yeah. materials like yttrium, barium, copper oxide only exhibit their superconductive properties when they are when cooled to a temperature cooled, of yeah. minus 180 degrees Celsius or minus 292 degrees Fahrenheit. Maintaining those low temperatures is going to be super impractical on, on desert, a planets, desert yeah. Or, you know, in the UK during the recent heat waves. For the Lexus commercial, they were literally pouring in liquid nitrogen to keep it working. Because if you don't, you'll find yourselves grounded once again. And that's not even the biggest issue. You may yeah. have caught it when I was explaining superconductors, but they aren't some magical material that just float on anything. Superconductors float because they produce a magnetic field. And if you've ever played with magnets as you a need kid, another magnetic as an adult, field. don't judge me, you'll know that a magnetic field will only repel if you have two magnets of the same polarity. Meaning, for the superconductor's magnetic field to cause it to float, there would have to be a magnetic field underneath it for it to repel against in the first place. And that is exactly what is happening in this commercial. According to The Verge, The board must be ridden above a highly engineered track that's carefully embedded with magnets, strong enough to hold the board and a rider. Yep, this whole skate park, even the floor underneath the water, was covered with magnets. I mean, look, you can even see that where they implanted the track right there. But, I mean, if you want to know how, like, revolutionary superconductors would be, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of loath to talk about it, but I mean, look at Avatar. In the first movie, that's the entire reason they went to Pandora, because Pandora had, again, such a stupid name, Unobtainium, which is a room temperature superconductor. That's also the reason why you had those floating mountains. They were made of the stuff, and they were floating in the moon's uh, uh, magnetic field, basically. As soon as you leave that magnetic floor, that board and our speeder is going to just drop out of the sky. Now, uh, according to the Ultimate Star Wars reference book, planets like Tatooine have large amounts of metal ores close to the surface, and those ores have strange magnetic properties. So if all other planets were the same, then it might be possible for superconductors to be used for speeders. But it yeah, but certainly not isn't going to help us the same. on our planet. And call me crazy, but I'm not exactly sure we could convince every world government to put a bunch of magnets underneath every square foot of ground just so I could feel cool while I ride my bike to the store. So and then on top of all of that, there's also the price of liquid nitrogen. Uh, it actually is the price of liquid nitrogen. Really, 13 cents to a dollar 78. The thing is, this is US dollars, but still. Okay, that's, that's cheaper than I thought it would be. But I mean, at the same time, I mean, this is still something that's literally evaporating into thin air as long as it's out of its cooling, out of its like cooling apparatus. So, I mean, you're still gonna be spending a lot of money on stuff like that. Granted, I mean, at the same time, thankfully it's not a greenhouse gas. So, I mean, eh. So if all existing science is going to fail me, then we're gonna have to try something a little more theoretical, my yeah. favorite. And in the world of theoretical science, there is something that not only allows for levitation, but doesn't require the installation of other materials into the ground, and it is still completely invisible to the naked eye. Let me introduce you all to the wonderful world of acoustic levitation, which is exactly what it sounds like. <sighs> yeah, even I'm disappointed in that one, sorry. Basically, acoustic levitation uses the power of sound waves to make things float. How exactly does that work? Well, it's a little complicated. It would probably take me hours to break it all down fully. Here's the simplified version. Levitation. If you have two speakers pointed at each other and start blasting some high frequency sound waves, something interesting happens. At certain points in between, the two waves would amplify each other, creating parts of the wave that are stronger and other parts of the waves that cancel out. The alternating patterns of strong and weak waves creates these little shelves that are able to hold objects in place. And the cool part is, even if you put something 
inside the field like your hand or a plant or rock that you're driving over, it doesn't interrupt the levitation field. It continues floating. It also works with liquids. They stay in droplet form and can be moved around and interact with other objects in the levitation field, which is so cool to see and could be used for a water fairing speeder. And if you're worried that these sound waves are going to be unsuitable for sneaking around hot outposts, rest assured that the sound being used to make acoustic levitation possible is ultrasonic, meaning it can't be heard by human ears. As for whether it can be detected by Jabba's ears, not Sure. Yeah, that's a kind Doesn't of important like question. Have ears? Regular slugs can't hear anything, so I guess we're fine. But you may have noticed that much like we needed two magnets for superconductors we to work for acoustic two... levitation, you need yeah, two speakers, speakers to make it work. Or do you? Experiment. I mean, okay, I, can, I think I can see where he's going with this, where you basically have it, like the sound being blasted at the ground, and when it and with it bouncing back up, it kind of creates. Um, the levitation using itself. So, though, I mean, how does that even work? Experiments have been done as far back as the 90s to try and eliminate the need for two speakers. They used just one speaker in directly at a 10 kilogram object and blasted it with sound waves to make it float. And you know what? It worked. Just about. It was only able no, to lift the about. object a few hundred micrometers, but still, like most science, this is only going to get better with micrometers, time. Micrometers, we'll be okay. Heavier and heavier things, higher and higher off the ground. All we'd need to do is theoretically turn the system over, blast sound waves at the ground, and because the ground ain't moving anywhere, you'd find yourself being lifted into the air. So then, why is there still a decent chunk of the video left? Because. Okay. So um. Again, I'm just, I'm just, you know, top of my head here, you know, this is sound. And even if, you know, humans can't hear it, that doesn't change the fact that, you know, the sound is there. So I can very possibly see, you know, there's a danger of, you know, you flying over something or someone and their head explodes, basically, from the absolutely like unimaginably powerful sound waves you're blasting down at the ground to have a flying motorcycle. So while I think this technology is cool and I really wanted it to be the solution, even on a theoretical level, there are still issues I can't overlook. Yes, okay. acoustic levitation could potentially raise your speed a while on solid ground, but as soon as you move over to the water, you're gonna run into some problems. All that talk about being able to levitate liquids with sound, yeah, doesn't really work in reverse. Liquid mm. is obviously not a solid, it's literally another state of matter. And so if you were to fire sound waves at it, it's gonna get pushed outwards, meaning your speeder has nothing to push against, and so you'll just keep sinking and sinking until you end up at the bottom of the lake. But I mean, admittedly, in game, the, the whole thing with riding over water was that was an upgrade you had to buy. So, but even if you decided to just ignore the hydro upgrades, you're still not really in the clear. Remember when I said the speakers use ultrasonic waves? That frequency may fall outside our normal range of hearing, but that doesn't mean it can't hurt the rest of you. Ultrasonic frequencies literally what I just said. 20 kilohertz, but people exposed to frequencies above just 17 kilohertz have been noted to suffer from fatigue, nausea, headaches, and dizziness. Long-term exposure, like riding your motorcycle for hours as you explore the open world, has the potential to cause even more damage to your biological tissues, heating them up through vibrations, leading to a severe case of death, which I would define as a suboptimal result. So, I mean, you were probably going to die anyway, but for using a flying motorcycle. I mean, what's the matter if you just speed up the process? Despite it being cool and definitely sci-fi as heck, I once again had to go back to the drawing board. And honestly, I was feeling pretty doubtful I was going to find something. Everything I tried, every scientific principle, every theoretical concept, nothing was able to completely satisfy the criteria set out by Star Wars Outlaws. And much like Kay during the game, I was running out of options. I was ready to hurl myself into the vacuum of space because at least then no one could hear me scream as I drove myself insane. And that's when it hit me. Space. I was so focused on technology being used to make hovering vehicles here on Earth, I completely ignored the fact that we have people who work day in and day out to defy the laws of gravity. NASA. Most of the time, they use what you'd expect for modern rockets. They get off the ground by essentially exploding large quantities of fuel and letting the force of that explosion lift the rocket into space. But that yeah. isn't the only kind of engine they have at their disposal. They have been working on other methods of propulsion for space travel, and one of them solves 
every problem we've had. It can keep things off the ground and off the water. It doesn't blow sand everywhere and it's completely silent. No fans, no magnets, no theoretical speakers. Plus, to top it all off, it could plausibly fit into our motorcycle-like design. At least in a few years. Ladies what? and gentlemen, I present to you Ion Propulsion. And it's so simple, I'm kind oh. of annoyed I didn't think about it sooner. Ion engines work by firing ions, if the name wasn't a big giveaway. Ions are particles that have either a positive or a negative charge. Most commonly these days, they use an element known as xenon. And through the use of powerful electric currents, these xenon atoms lose their electrons, forming positively charged xenon ions, which is then fired out of the back of the engines, providing thrust. NASA has been using these engines when they want to get satellites to very far distances very quickly. In fact, they've been using ion engines to explore the outer reaches of our solar system since as early as 1998 with the Deep Space One probe. But Wait, really? Huh! Okay, I had no idea that this technology was, you know, even a thing. Like, I I, I, I knew that, you know, I had heard of experiments, but I, I thought it was just that, you know, experimental. Huh, okay. But it doesn't just work in space where there's no gravity either. In 2021, undefined technologies created a fully electric hovering drone using, you guessed it, ion propulsion. And as you can see, it works. No big gusts of wind, no noise, just thrust. It also doesn't rely on having something solid beneath it to push against, which means it can work on water, on land, pretty much anywhere you can think of. It even solves problems I haven't mentioned about the speeder yet. K-Speeder is able to make very short and sharp side-to-side -side movements to avoid enemy fire at a push of a button. And one of the other upgrades she gets allows the speeder to do a short jump directly upwards. With most of our options, these just wouldn't be possible, at least not with the speed and precision that we see in the game. But with ion propulsion, we can. For dodging, all you have to do is have small ion thrusters in the correct spot, and then have a button to activate that thruster for a quick burst of side-to-side -side movement. And for the jump, ion propulsion works just like any other thruster. Give it a little more juice by having a button that injects a couple million extra ions through the a thruster, Bam, yeah. you gain some extra height for a short moment. Now, I should probably say that at this point in time, the best ion engines we have are only able to generate about one newton of force, which is a far cry from the 650 newtons you need to pick up a person, let alone a, a motorcycle. motorcycle Even yeah. how this kind of technology tends to develop over time, it's only going to get better from here. And do you know who else believed in that idea? George Lucas himself. Because the funniest part of all of this is that ion propulsion has been used for countless vehicles in oh my god right the tie fighters that's right they're they're that's part of their the tie fighters they're 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 that's what tie stands for doesn't it the i is ion oh god what what's the full thing of tie fighter stand for that's literally okay there it is tie the tie in tie fighter stands for twin ion engine it's the twin ion engine fighter I had completely, I know, I know I had heard of twin, I, I know I had heard of like ion engines before. I had completely forgotten about their connection to Star Wars. Oh. In the Star Wars universe. It just tends to be for the bigger spacefaring ones rather than the smaller on planet ones. TIE Fighter literally stands for twin ion engines. So we exactly. don't even have to break the law for this to be possible. I mentioned that NASA had been using ion thrusters to explore deep space since 1998, but the first ever engine was actually tested in 1964. So it would seem that George is just like us. He was literally putting the science into science fiction. He used a technology that, no, didn't completely work when it was first tested and it wouldn't be perfected or widely adopted for a good few years. But he saw the potential if you just gave it time. And that, friends, is what it truly means to be a theorist. All we need now is for NASA to stop trying to send people to Mars and instead working on making ion-propelled hover bikes. Please, I need it. Shut up and take my money. But hey, I just got to say thank you one final time. Oh God, you know, it's absolutely nuts. Again, oh, I mean, it's, it's game theory. So at the end of the day i'm used to this whole thing where they take like the really outlandish expectation and then find some sort of little thing in real life to plug it in it's like hey it could actually work but just thinking going back to the whole thing i was talking about before about like losing power on like hover vehicles like they use well i mean the examples we use today they use um xenon gas for the ion engines so it needs fuel still 
I mean, you probably find some other type of gas. But the, I mean, obviously, I think they they would use xenon because it's an in, it's an inert gas, right? Because it doesn't react with anything. Hmm. Because I was about to say, oh, why don't you use something like hydrogen? But like, you know, hydrogen's very flammable and also has you know a tendency to leak out of any solid surface because the atoms are so small. And also the atoms are small, so having them go out might not produce that much thrust. Hmm. Again, so many questions for people much smarter than I am who have probably already figured out this sort of stuff. So, I mean, out of all the ways that Tom could have figured out how to get, you know, hover technology in real life, I didn't envision it, you know, being something that we're actually already using. And again, I had no idea. I thought ion engines, like, I mean, I had never seen that, like, little test thing before. I thought that only actually worked in space where you didn't have, like, an atmosphere or something like that. So, I mean, the fact that it actually works in real life, I mean, that's, that well, shocking, but also awesome at the same time. So, yeah, that's going to be it for now. So, of course, as always, original video is linked in the description if you haven't seen it yet for some reason. Corner video will lead to my film theory reaction. And, yeah, with all that out of the way, I hope you guys liked. If you did, leave a like, subscribe if you have not, and I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.